Welcome to the Fishing Daily's Tech Talk podcast. Today we're diving into the world of Rescue Unit, a Norwegian company on a mission to revolutionize the fishing industry by tackling the growing problem of lost fishing gear. The company has developed an innovative product, aptly named Rescue Unit. Rescue Unit is designed to reduce the financial burden on fishermen by preventing gear loss, protect the marine ecosystem, and preserve the biomass for the future of generations by reducing ghost fishing. In this episode, we'll explore the technology behind Rescue Unit, hear first-hand experiences from renowned fisherman Captain Sig Hansen of the Northwestern, known for 19 seasons on the deadliest catch, and discuss the global impact this product is set to make on the fishing industry. So, grab your headphones and let us set sail on a journey to learn more about the game-changing rescue unit. Welcome, all Captain right. Sig Hansen, all the way from Seattle, Washington in the USA, and to Olga Treto Olsen, all the way from Stavanger in Norway. Sig and Helge, um, how did your collaboration begin and what inspired both of you to join forces in the development and launch of rescue unit? Well, as far as collaboration, it took a little while. Um, I felt like I was being stalked by Helgi, and I've had stalkers before, but this was quite different and unique. So put it this way, in my words, his his perseverance paid off. Helgi, what do you think about that statement? Yeah, I, I like that better. Uh, if, if you can picture me as the guy who don't give up instead of a, a stalker, that's, that's good. But uh, yeah, you can tell the story about when you were in Norway promoting a clothing line and what happened. That's a good story. Yeah, no, we were we were promoting a clothing line, and we had a, a actually we had a, a plane that we were flying from city to city, and I think it was two or three cities in a row that uh, Helgi had pursued us, and um, with the idea for rescue unit and and uh, and what it, it can offer, and so I thought to myself, well, Jesus, this guy's not giving up, and uh, I've been approached by many other companies to represent uh, and be the quote-unquote poster child for for different uh, items. And uh, I thought to myself, well, okay, this is fishing related. And, uh, you know, if he's not full of it, uh, maybe there's something behind this. And so I'm always skeptical about things like that and uh, for obvious reasons. And so uh, when uh, he was pursuing, I think it was the third time uh, we were at an event promoting our clothing line. Next thing you know, uh, I said, tell you what, and I looked at the item and I remember um, I remember saying, well, if you can change, you know, X, Y, and Z, I had some small changes and son of a gun, don't you think everything that I had mentioned, they had changed. And I thought these guys are serious. And that's what really grabbed me. And after that, we've been, uh, we've been running full steam ahead ever since. And Helge, what's it like having Sagan board? Uh, there's, yeah, no, that has helped us tremendously. You know, he's uh, in our customer group. He is, uh, he is famous. His, his TV show has been in 150 countries, and we are a global company. Uh, so that notoriety gives us a, a great access to the markets in a way that we would never have uh, without Sig. So having a, a person like that behind it, that really means a lot for us. And can you explain the technology behind Rescue Unit, uh, how it functions, how it prevents gear loss and the ways it will be of benefit to the, to the fishing industry? Yeah, so so the problem we address is lost fishing gear, basically. And the principle is very easy. Uh, what what often happens to fishing equipment is that the primary buoy gets cut, cut off by a propeller or for whatever reason. Uh, and now you have a lost trap. Uh, that trap is often made of plastics or, or uh, and, and it's a pollution in and of itself. Uh, But then again, you have the ghost fishing problem. Uh, These lost traps, they continue to fish in perpetuity. They catch animals, starve to death, and become bait for the next generation of animals. And this goes on and on for decades and maybe even centuries before they decompose. Uh, And also you have, of course, the financial part of it. The gear loss is expensive to the fishermen. Uh, So what we have is a functional, easy, we call it a backup buoy system. Uh, You have a backup buoy that is attached to the gear. And if the gear remains underwater for a certain amount of time, and that time you can program with an app, so you can set it to five days, three days, 10 days, or whatever. Uh, and when the trap remains underwater for that amount of time, it releases the backup buoy to the surface with a line still attached to the to the trap. 
and now you can easily locate and, and retrieve your lost fishing gear. And Sig, uh, in your experience as a fisherman, um, how significant is the problem of lost fishing gear? Well, and, and, and you know, you got to remember, I've been doing this for a few decades now, and I shudder to think how many traps or pots, we call them, that I've lost just in my lifetime. And so it was very significant, um, especially for us in Alaska, where we deal with a lot of ice. Um, you know, when you do the math, Today, uh, one crab trap is going to cost around uh, over $2,000 U.S. And, uh, for each one. And uh, back in the day when we were fishing uh, three, four, sometimes 500 pots, uh, you know, you'd get tangled with the ice and uh, they would grab your gear, your buoys, and then slowly drag them right over the edge, uh, right into the deep, and then they're gone forever. So tens of thousands of pots, uh, hundreds if not within, within the fleet over these uh, past few decades have been have been gone because of, you know, either either misplaced, uh, uh, tanglements, uh, or, or, or just propellers, or just simply uh, with the ice. And so you add all that money up and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a hard pill to swallow. Not only that, I mean, environmentally, you think, well, boy, we, we really have uh, done a lot of damage and, and maybe now it's time to start to see things uh, maybe from a different angle, I, I guess you could say. And losing a pot and, and your fishery, it's not just the, the value of the pot itself, it's what it earns in a lifetime. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, when you add those numbers up, uh, the, the numbers are staggering. And so, um, like I said, it's, uh, and Helgi said, you know, the pot continues to fish in perpetuity. And not only that, but with the pollution aspect of it, it, it all adds up to, to, to uh, a negative impact regardless. And uh, for me, uh, it's always about the money, especially when you lose a lot of gear at one time in a derby style fishery, you know, every pot matters and every minute matters. And so we've had those incidents where you start losing a lot of gear and uh, you sure see it at the end of the at the end of the day when you're going to settle up for your crew. Yeah, and and pot fishing and trap fishing is is enormous worldwide. Can you talk a little bit about the markets you operate in as you launch Rescue Unit worldwide? Which markets do you believe will benefit the most from its adoption, and and why? Right now, we are targeting most the lobster fisheries in Canada. Uh, but also we we have uh, we have had some participation or some presence in uh, both uh, Ireland. We were at the Skipper Expo uh, in uh, this year, and we go to the the Expo in Scotland uh, this weekend. I think it is. Uh, and then we have also had projects uh, basically all, all over the world: Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, Miami. Uh, but the, the, we want to target the customers that will benefit the most from our product. So that's why we're we're locating and aiming at the fishermen that fish with traps in a string. So when you have like five, ten traps and just one primary buoy, uh, then you you're you're good with one rescue unit on a string like that, and then the return of investment becomes really significant. So that's kind of the lowest hanging fruit for us now in the beginning. Uh, so we're targeting those. Uh, fisheries and and those are everywhere. I, I'm not sure how many fish, fish with the trap in in Ireland and in, in UK, uh, but I think there is quite a lot of it there too. But uh, stone crab, blue crab fishing in in Miami, Dungeness fishing in the west coast of US, and you have also the lobster fishery in Atlantic Canada. Very exciting and and uh, good regions for us to focus on. So, uh, in Alaska, how's the idea of the rescue unit been t taken? Well, in Alaska, you're dealing with very strong tide, tidal currents, and you're dealing with, uh, you know, changes, uh, uh, you know, with these tides, different heights. But uh, we're going to try Alaska, but we need uh, a little heavier equipment for that. So for now, we want to focus on the smaller traps, such as lobster or Dungeness, and then move on from there. Right now, we are in development for the larger traps. And, uh, you know, the theory is the same. Everything works the same. And uh, I have experimented in Alaska, and we were successful, but we still want to make sure that uh, everything is perfect before we bring it into a marketplace like that. And so it, it can be utilized in Alaska as well. Looking forward for the project, what's the long-term goals 
Uh, well, of course, we're a business, so we're, we're in this, of course, to, to make a profit also long term. But uh, I think the important thing for us is because there is done a lot of great work uh, in cleaning up these traps that have been lost. There are people cleaning up on the on the shores. There are there are ROVs uh, and draggers that are, are trying to locate these lost gear from the seafloor. Because uh, the, remember, these traps are are stealing from the resources. They're killing animals for the benefit of no one, uh, and they are harming the industry long term. Uh, so if we can get to that point where our preventive solution can result in there being lost fewer than what is recovered, that is kind of a, a tipping point. That is my personal goal to get to that level. Uh, and uh, and now there is a lot of focus on cleaning up. Uh, we want to shift that focus to what really matters, which is prevention, uh, and then the cleaning starts making sense because then you clean up more than you lose, and that's uh, th that'll be a win for me. Right, and for me, uh, when I think about it, it's also about uh, sustainable fisheries and a sustainable future. You know, I mean, I have a young daughter that's uh, interested in our fishery, and you know, I'm one of many examples where you have these uh, family, uh, you know. Uh, legacies or family industries that are handed down from generation to generation. So part of it is just for, for for me, it's trying to be a little more responsible. And, you know, now with new technology and, and the way uh, the world is changing so quickly, you, you almost have to try to change with it, right? Try to stay ahead of the curve. And uh, that's how you're only going to uh, have a sustainable future, in my opinion. This is a fantastic idea. I've been following it since basically its inception, since these guys wrote to me uh, a couple of years ago. Now, what's political support like for this? Is there, we have a, we're hearing a lot about the Green campaign and everything else, and this is a fantastic idea. Are they coming on board with us? Are you getting the backing from politicians? Uh, absolutely, to a certain degree. But of course, the politicians want to see this surviving in the marketplace on its own. They want to see fishermen buying it. Uh, but there's been tremendous interest. Uh, I mean, the, uh, it was the Minister of Fishery from Prince Edward Island in Canada. He traveled to Norway uh, to to come and see the product. We took him out of the boat and we demonstrated the product to him. Uh, and he's been a champion in his region over there for for us and for the solution for the company. Uh, but also we we see from uh, from Norwegian governments. We have uh, we had a meeting with the Portuguese Minister of Fisheries uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we see a lot of interest in this. Uh, and I think long term, uh, there's going to be governments go, go, getting more behind it, uh, also regulatory wise. Uh, but I think that's a little bit into the future. I'm not quite sure, but because uh, there is almost like a panicky situation out there. Uh, when researchers find out the numbers that are being wasted of valuable good seafood being wasted, uh, and the pollution of it. So you you never know. Uh, it is our goal to to have it mandatory, of course. Uh, but but I think we right now we have a reasonable price product uh, where the fishermen can be upfront. They don't they don't want to sit and wait until they, this uh, or, or something like this gets uh, jammed down their throat. So here they have an opportunity to show that they they uh, they can um, take sustainable measures on on their own uh, and being kind of ahead of the of the regulations. Well, I mean, the bottom line is no fisherman likes to be told what to do. I don't care if you're in Scotland or or Ireland or America. It doesn't matter. If you're a fisherman, you don't like being told how to fish, where to fish, and what to fish, and how to do it, right? But at the end of the day, like Helgi said, you got to try to stay ahead of it. And I think that, you know, this is a good way to stop ropeless fishing, which is a, an extreme problem, uh, Canadian waters, U.S. waters, you know, because of whale entanglement, things of that nature. So we're trying to stay ahead of the curve with these innovative ideas and, and, and thereby being able to fish longer and stronger, right? And so even if you were to back it up uh, politically with government, you know, then I would I believe that you'll get these subsidies from government and then everybody wins. So... That's the way I kind of look at things, you know. I've had my head buried in the sand for so many years, like an ostrich, you know, denial. Just just let the world move on and let me do my thing. But now it's a different world out there. Time to grow up. And uh, <laughs> it just took me a while to figure that out. And that's, that's my take on it. So when you talk about government, yeah, I do believe that 
if you don't get ahead of it, like Helgi said, then they're going to jam it down your throat, and you might end up paying for it. If you can get it subsidized, well, hell, that's a win-win. And you're working together with not just government, but environmentally speaking, and, and uh, you know, you get to keep fishing. I mean, that's a win. And technologies like this, a lot of people tend to be afraid of it. How simple is this device to use and how to set up? Yeah, no, that was uh, one of the, the good inputs we got from Sig right away because he knows that fishermen don't want to be operating buttons and programming stuff on the boat. It's cold, they got gloves on, it's it's uh, it's very uh, different environment out there than in our comfortable offices. Uh, so we had the the one of the primary focus was to have as little interaction as possible for the fishermen. Uh, so we made the units know that it's, it's self-aware, uh, which means that when you throw it in the water, it, it knows that it's in the water and it starts counting down. And once you take it out, even if it's just for a second and throw it back out, the timer resets. So there's no button you need to press between every time you fish, no reset function, nothing. Uh, you set your preferred release time when you buy the product you do that once uh, you set it to your three five ten days or whatever suits you're fishing and then install it on just 10 zip ties and the unit is installed and then you can just do what you want to do and that's fish the product will will just stay on there and, and do its job when you need it to and say so from your point of view as the fisherman well what i like about it is you just got to install it one time and then you're done you know what i mean whether it's on a string of gear or individual pots you know you do it one time and then like Helgi said you just reset it and then it'll reset itself every time you pull it that's the nice thing about it as well it's very durable you know we've had some crash tests uh, going on with these things and they're very durable so i, I like that installation is very easy i like that and I also uh, am pretty proud to say that we have different models out there so that it's not just one type of unit. You know, the company is being more flexible with the different type of models that we're developing to, uh, you know, to, to accommodate different fisheries of all kinds. And that's what's very important. So um, to me, you know, if you can make it easy, do it once, you're one and done, uh, you know, you can't complain about that. Something like this uh, will change the way people fish, not just in Norway, but all over the world. So it's definitely something that should be on the agenda for a lot of otter trap fishermen. I, I think it's going to be on the agenda whether you like it or not. You know, that's the, that's the thing. So um, if a guy wants a future, uh, I think, you know, you can be like me, bury your head in the sand until politics uh, come around and slap you in the face, or you get ahead of it and uh, and just deal with it, you know? It's, look, man, the, the way that we, th this thing is, it, it's the first of its kind that's been patented, which we're very proud of. But the reality is, you know, mechanisms like this have been used in the past. I'm one of them. Because when we fished illegally back in the day, let's call it, and you wanted to do a little snooping around before a season, you know, this method was done back then. And it did help you get a little uh, advantage before the preseason start so that you could, you could kind of know where you're going to go and then uh, and, and have a, a season out of it, right? So uh, it's amazing how things come around full circle from, from, you know, from my personal experience, you know, 20, 30 years ago, being sneaky and maybe taking a little look out there to see what's going on before the season start with, with the same kind of a, a innovation. And then now full circle to where 
you want this legalized because you see the the benefits uh, all the way around. You follow me? Yep, I get you. And just now when we're talking about coming around full circle, um, Norway, it's very close to your heart. We've seen that in the, um, the Viking returns on Discovery. What's your long term plans for Norway? Will you be spending more time there? And will we see another season of the Viking returns? Well, uh, long term plans, uh, I think, you know, my wife said this many years ago, uh, it was actually uh, on a on a video we did here in Seattle, and she said someday we'll probably retire in Norway because that's her hometown uh, as well as where, where her parents are from, the same as mine. So as fate would have it, she's probably right, like she always is. Uh, right now, we're actually looking at a, a, a place to reside in. Uh, I, I did acquire my grandmother's home, so, uh, you know, we're not out on the street yet. Um, as far as the Viking returns, um, we're going to look at that next year. Discovery has gone through some major changes. And uh, in the meantime, I still want to pursue some of the fisheries there and uh, try to stay ahead of that and, and keep doing my homework there and stay involved. Um, so I think that uh, that will happen uh, as well. Uh, right now, Deadliest Catch is in, is in its uh, 19th season. And so I do believe that, uh, you know, if, if and when they fish next year, uh, you know, that's 20 years uh, on television and that's quite an accomplishment. So it's been a, a, a win all the way around, you know, as far as showing the world, uh, you know, the, 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 pr the, the products that are out there, you know, the species and how it gets from the, from the, from the source to the plate, the ocean to the plate. Uh, you know, the risks that, that all fishermen take across the globe. And so I think uh, when we decided to do it, I believe that buy that kind of advertising, and that's exactly what happened. And so, uh, and there's good and bad, right? There's always a negative side and a positive side. But at the end of the day, uh, it's brought awareness to people across the globe. And uh, it's really, I think, given a lot of fame to fishermen in, in many different countries and not just crustacean, but you know, for the trawlers, longliners, these, you know, the, 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 the guys that fish with hook, all of them deserve credit. And I think that, uh, you know, Deadliest Catch is the one that started that. And so for me, I want to see it uh, continue. And for me, I want to see, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, the Viking return so that we can uh, share what we've been up to with the, uh, you know, the rest of the, the world, it's, it's a lot of fun. As long as you succeed, it's no fun when you fail on TV. Trust me, you get to relive it a few times. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, that, that's, that's the way it is. And and say like, now, what's the difference between fishing in Norway and fishing at home? Well, I think Norway, fishing in Norway uh, is a little bit more organized. Um, I think they, I'll give them credit, they got a little more style. Larger crews, um, you know, they, there's different uh, politics there. Where Alaska, even though we are a rationalized fishery, it's still a little faster paced, let's call it. And so there's that. I, I think you still have a faster pace in Alaska. Uh, the, as far as the weather uh, in Norway, when it comes to fishing crab, they're way up north much farther north than we get to the Russian border. But uh, that being said, so their temperatures are, are extreme. Uh, I think the, the waves, uh, the seas in Alaska are different than anywhere on earth because we have uh, this shelf that comes up from a thousand fathoms to, to, to nothing, right? 70 fathom edge, 90 fathom. And then, uh, so when you get these west, northwest winds, you get these very tall seas that are very, very close together. And that's always been the difference I've noticed from place to place. So that's what makes Alaska uh, a scary place to uh, to work in. But uh, environments are, are, are similar. Uh, I think the Alaska's, you know, uh, uh, still a little bit more aggressive when it comes to the fisheries. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're getting the job done, right? That's all that matters. And, uh, and I think Norway's uh, doing well the way they do their their business and Alaska, you know, uh, they've been 
uh, trying to be sustainable and, and uh, you know, they're some of the best of the best. Uh, that state has uh, come a long way. Yeah, what we've seen now the past few years, we've seen the red king crab and this last year, the snow crab uh, fishing being closed. How much of an impact has that been for you and the rest of the fleet? I think uh, as far as the closure, um, it was a close call. And so, you know, when you when you think of the state of Alaska right now, and I can't speak for everyone there politically, but in my opinion, uh, I've noticed that, you know, I remember we used to take 50% of the mature males off the grounds, you know. You know, nowadays uh, we take 15% and with even more conservative measures. And so, you know, it's very conservative. Uh, and that being said, we've still seen a, a decline in some of the uh, animals, the quota out there. Um, there's a lot of skepticism. Is it, you know, is it is it global warming? Is it predation? Is it management? You know, what is it, right? And so they're having a hard time putting their finger on that. And that's something that I wouldn't dare speak to. I do have my opinions. Um, and you got to remember that... Uh, in that ecosystem, all the different species across the board uh, are fished, uh, you know, as human for human consumption. And so, uh, I think that because of uh, being so conservative, sometimes you know you'll see an impact from one species to another. So it's up to man to decide to take a little bit more on one side so that the other side can rebound. And that. For me, I think that's more of the problem going on. And so I think next year we'll see a, a, definitely a king crab fishery, the snow crab market. Uh, I think that's going to rebound, um, but uh, it, it's touchy, man. It's not the first time we've seen this, you know. It, it does go up and down, and uh, if someone wants a, a very sustainable lifestyle, then don't go fishing. But if you can handle the, the swings, uh, it's it's a hell of a way to to have a life. Let me tell you. Well, hopefully we'll see the red king crab back next season. It'll be exciting to see the boats back fishing it. Now, um, Helge, where can we find out more about Rescue Unit? Uh, we have a, a website, rescueunit.com. That's R E S Q Unit. R E S Q Unit dot com. Uh, also, I briefly mentioned we're going to be at the uh, Skipper Expo in Scotland this weekend. Uh, so anyone who wants to uh, talk to us there can uh, reach out to our website. There's a contact form uh, and uh, and we'll get in touch with you and schedule something. Uh, so so we'll have one representative there. I won't be there, for, unfortunately, neither will SIG, but we'll have one of our representatives there. And if you're interested to, to learn more about the product as a customer, as a distributor or as a Whatever support function you see, then uh, our website is the is the right place. Uh, we have our own YouTube cha channel. We're on LinkedIn, and you can find us uh, pretty much all over the internet. Uh, not many companies or name call Rescue Unit, so uh, just Google that, and you'll find us in in many places. And Sig, will you be uh, attending any shows sometime soon? Yeah, I definitely am on the drawing board uh, when I can attend. And so uh, right now I'm going to take the summer off. So uh, I, I've got a trip to Canada planned out, I believe, with Helgi there. And and so we're going to definitely try to to uh, be involved as much as I can. Uh, I won't be uh, on our salmon tendering charter this summer. Um, my son-in-law is going to take the boat. And so that'll uh, afford me some more time to, to do some of the other things that I want to do in life. And, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So, I mean, for as for my participation, a lot of this is because, uh, you know, you set a goal, you want to see it through, right? So it's almost like a dare. This is something different than just going out and going fishing. You know, this is a different world for me. And I enjoy it a lot because it's uh, it's challenging and, and, uh, and that's always fun. Well, thank you very much for joining us here. And I'm sure everybody's very interested in the product and and having Captain Sig Hansen here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us.